don't hear anything. Okay, everyone. As promised, is here in the flesh. <laughs> so we're gonna get this thing. People uh, log in. So just last quick thing. Looks like everyone's on mute. Make sure you have you see ways to mute. Uh, it's either the microphone at the top you can turn on and off. Um, if you've come in on a conference call, which doesn't look like too many use the phone line, but if you did, maybe just use your mute tools on there just to make sure we keep a quiet room. Uh, the way to interact with us and with Kristen will be that chat pod, which I'm actually going to take away in a minute, but there'll be a Q&A pod there for you. And it'll queue up anything that you want to ask. And by the way, those questions are private. We see them, but doesn't go to the whole room. And so uh, we won't necessarily address who sent in what, but we will try to get to all of them that we do see. Um, I don't think there's anything more technical. I do want to just say how thankful we are for Kristen doing these. When we look at the attendee list, I know there's Tulsa Dental clients, and I know there's Kristen clients, so we're happy to have all of you. Um, and we are just so fortunate for her to be sharing these things, um, which is a little bit out of our normal thing for Tulsa Dental, but we really appreciate the tips that she does. Um, the files at the bottom right are going to be their all program for you to make use of. If you want CE credit, you will have to do that one called Quiz, and there's some instructions on it to send back to me, and we will process those for you. I think, without further ado, I'm going to step out of this and just be your backstage host, and Kristen will take over. Thank you, John, for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this very important topic, closing the back door to your practice. I see dentists spending thousands of dollars per month on external marketing um, to attract new patients. And what I would like to talk about this evening is how to retain those patients and close the back door because those dollars can be wasted if you have new patients coming in the front door but existing patients are slipping out the back door. So that's going to be our primary focus for this webinar. And I have this um, content really um, packed in this evening because I want to make sure that you have things that you can take away and implement um, right away. I want to give you tips and tools that will help you not only retain more patients, but keep your schedule full and have happier patients while you're doing it. So there are three core areas for this evening. We're going to start with talking about systems and how important they are to keeping your patients active in the practice. We want to have key, um, systems that are consistent so you can have a predictable result in your practice with keeping patients active. The second aspect we're going to discuss is value and how to create more value and more perceived value with your current patients. Because patients that really value the services that you're providing stay in the practice. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is the mindset. And we're going to talk about some of the limiting beliefs that I see holding practices back from reaching their ultimate potential with keeping their patients active. So let's start with talking about systems. And what systems are we talking about? There are so many systems tied to keeping your patients active in the practice. Some people think of the continuing care system, and while that is one of the core systems, there are many other systems that need to be in place and need to be consistent in order for you to keep your patients active. And you can see from this diagram that there are several systems that we're going to cover tonight. I'm going to give you tips on how to enhance those or add those systems to help keep your patients active. So the first set of systems that I want to talk to you about is confirming your hygiene appointments. So how many have a full schedule, maybe even scheduling out several weeks or months on your hygiene schedule, and you have your schedule fall apart at the very last minute, even the day before. And that results in scrambling to fill your schedule um, last minute. And that's frustrating and it's time consuming. I've seen team members spend an entire morning or an entire afternoon, even an entire day, trying to fill just a one hour opening. 
And if any of you uh, watching confirm the appointments or you're responsible for filling the hygiene schedule, I know um, how frustrating that can be. So I'm going to give you some tips on your confirmation protocols in the practice. Now I know there are many different ways that you can confirm appointments, especially with the technology that is available today. There are a lot of systems that you can use, whether it's Smile Reminder or Demand Force. Um, some offices are still using postcards and phone calls. So I want to encourage you to focus on the process and start where you are and use what you have. You don't have to have the, the latest technology to implement these systems, but if you do, then that will only enhance this process. So the first thing that I suggest when confirming appointments is to give the patient a heads up three to four weeks in advance. If you're using um, electronic confirmations, this could be an email, or you could also do a postcard. This just gives the patient that quick reminder to keep the practice top of mind, to remember that they have an appointment coming up. And so you'll do that three to four weeks ahead of time. The next step in the confirmation protocol is the one week call. And to call the patient a full week before the appointment. Now, this isn't an actual confirmation call. You'll use this call to let the patient know that you're preparing for their appointment and you want to make sure that this is still a good time for them. A lot of these patients made this appointment six months ago. And when we wait until the day before to call them, it only causes frustration when the patient tells us that something has come up and this day isn't going to work for them. So if you're thinking about the timing of this or thinking that you don't have time to make these one-week calls, I want to spend just a minute to tell you about the results that many of my clients have seen adding this very important step to your system. By adding this one-week call and actually giving the patient the opportunity to make a change if they need to, you have an entire week to fill your schedule if they do need to change. And it's really a win-win. Um, the patient is able to change their appointment and you have time to fill your schedule with plenty of notice. So when you, when you make the one-week call, sometimes you will have to leave a message. And if that happens, I recommend that you set the expectation that if you don't hear back from them, you'll try again in a couple of days just to make sure that they have um, you on their schedule. Um, the next step is to do the day before call. Now this is something that many practices following my system decide to make a permission-based step. And what I mean by that is on the one-week call, what they'll do is they'll tell the patient that's confirming that as a courtesy, they can also call the patient the day before if that's helpful. And patients typically will let you know if that's something that they need. They'll either say, nope, I've got you on my schedule, I'm good. Or they'll say, you know what, it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to give me another reminder. And so then you can follow up again the day before the appointment. This is really important to make sure that you have enough time to fill your hygiene schedule because the patients did make these appointments many, many months ago. Hey, real quick question. Sure. I'm going to see if I can pound this over to you. But there is a question I thought you might want to sure. take a look at real quick. <clears throat> Not that. Yeah, if you can take a peek at that one real quick. Okay. <laughs> Maybe read that out. <clears throat> okay, so the question is that this practice uses Practice Mojo, which I have heard of that, to text and email reminders two weeks, one week, and two days before appointments. 85% of people um, to do respond, or they don't respond at all. Think that's it's right. frustrating. I'm sure that's very frustrating. So what do you recommend we do differently? So the very first thing that I would start with, well, there's a couple of things. The first thing I would do is look at your wording um, on what you're asking them to do in that email and what is your call to action. You may also want to um, just double check the technical side of that. I do know that some of those programs give you the option for the patient to respond or not respond, so you want to check your settings and make sure that you have that set up correctly. Um, you can also evaluate your patient demographics and make sure that your patient base um, prefers this method of, of contact. There are different surveys and things that you can do to 
um, assure that and, and just double check that and see if that's the case. Um, you know, I have had practices, um, depending on the type of service they're using, have better results. I've even had practices that switched from one to the next and for whatever reason they were getting more of a response. So um, you might check with Practice Mojo and see if they have any suggestions for you. If you um, email me or contact me, and our contact information will be up on the last slide, I would be happy to share with you or anyone that's interested the wording that I've found to be the most effective on those communications with the patients. So hopefully that's helpful. Okay, so the next system that I want to talk about is pre-appointing. And so it's really important that every patient leaves with an appointment. And if you're using the confirmation strategies that we just talked about, it's okay to pre-appoint, I would say, 95 to 100% of every patient that leave the practice and make sure that they have their next appointment scheduled. Some of you may be thinking, we already do that. We're already scheduling every patient before they leave. But I would encourage you to make sure that you have a way utilizing your practice management software to measure that. I do have many practices that when we're looking at these statistics together, um, we find that they feel like they're pre-appointing all of their patients, but when we look at the actual data, it's closer to 75 or 80 percent of their patients that are leaving with their next appointment. So it's really important to make sure that every patient leads, or leaves with their next appointment. And when you're doing this, I really encourage you to lead the patient to make the next appointment and to not ask the patient if they want to schedule. And the difference is just changing the language that you're using when you're making that request. So instead of saying, would you like to make your appointment for six months, which many people will say, I don't know what I'm doing in six months, I'll just call you, try saying, let's get your next appointment made. I have in six months a Tuesday at 9 or a Thursday at 3, which would you prefer? And just give them a couple of options and most of your patients will follow you wherever you're leading them when you're scheduling. So you really want to focus on having 95 to 100 percent of your patients leaving the practice with their next appointment. So cancellations. This has to be one of the most frustrating things for practices that really want to keep their patients active and have a full schedule. And so I want us to talk about some steps that you can take to reduce the number of cancellations that you have in your practice. The first thing that I want to talk about is the resource that John mentioned earlier that you can download um, in the web room. And it's labeled, um, what's it labeled, John? <laughs> we hit it for a second. I think it's scheduling for success. So I'm giving you some verbal skills that you can use on how to handle cancellations when they come in. And I recommend that you review these at a team meeting, highlight key phrases that are important to utilize, because you want to use your own, your own words and your own voice, but it's really important that you use these key phrases in order to follow a protocol to prevent as many of these cancellations as you possibly can. I have many offices ask me, should we charge a cancellation fee? And my answer to that is, if you have all of the appropriate steps in place for keeping your patients active, that can be one element of the system. But before you start charging patients for missing their appointments, I want you to take a really close look at how the practice is doing with, number one, setting expectations. Because the cancellation protocol should really um, only come into play if you didn't set proper expectations. I'm in offices um, often observing, and one of the things that I see is a patient standing at the front checking out, and the team member will make an appointment, put it on a card, hand it to the patient, and say, thank you, we'll see you at your next visit, without setting any expectation about what we, the practice, expects as far as that patient keeping their appointment or how we want the patient to handle it if they're not able to keep their appointment. So it's really important to set a clear expectation. 
And that can be as simple as saying, uh, Kristen, uh, we're reserving a full hour on our schedule for you for this next appointment. If for some reason you can't make this appointment, we ask that you give us a minimum of 48 hours notice so we can fill that time with another patient. And you just look the patient in the eye, set the expectation, and most patients, when you set that expectation, they want to follow the rules and they want to um, make sure that they're following any protocol that's set. The second thing is to make sure that you're really communicating what your policy is. If you have a fee, make sure the patient knows about it and make sure that they don't find out about that fee when they're calling to cancel and you're informing them on that call. If your patient does uh, miss an appointment and you do assess a broken appointment fee, it shouldn't be a surprise to the patient because when it is, the patient gets really frustrated and they get upset and sometimes they'll leave the practice over that. So I really want you to focus on the front end things that you can do to set good expectations um, and then make that cancellation fee something that is a rare occurrence because your patients are keeping their appointments. And that expectation doesn't only happen at the um, counter when you're making the appointment. It's when you're making your confirmation calls um, and any step throughout the process where you can remind the patient um, how you want them to handle things if they're not able to keep that appointment. The third thing, and I think this is really important, is to respect your patient's time. It's, not, um, it's really not good to ask your patients to respect your time while the practice doesn't always respect the patient's time. And what I mean by respecting your patient's time is a couple of things. One is take a look at how often you're moving patient appointments. Now I know there are times where that is completely unavoidable. You have a sick hygienist or a sick doctor or something comes up where you need to move the appointment. But I want you to really focus on not doing that unless you absolutely have to. Because you don't want to teach your patients that anytime something comes up, we just move the appointment. So resist moving appointments around as much as you possibly can. The other thing that I mean when I say respect your patient's time is do your best to run on time. I know that there are situations where things come up unexpectedly in the clinical appointment and you do run behind and that's to, to be expected on occasion. But if your practice consistently runs behind, it's just teaching the patient that this time is a is kind of a loose time and you come and maybe you wait 30 minutes every time. And so if the patient um, senses that you're behind a lot, maybe they think you're too busy and it won't really matter if they miss their appointment. Um, so you really want to look at that. And if a patient is um, 10 minutes late and you reschedule them because they're late, but you make them wait 30 minutes every time they come in, it's just sending a mixed message that your time is valuable, but their time is not. So setting expectations, communicating your policies, and respecting the patient's time are all things that can help you prevent cancellations. When those things don't work and you're on the phone and the patient is canceling, the resource provided in the Scheduling for Success document will really help your team know what to say, how to attempt to save the appointment, and if the patient ultimately does cancel, how to handle it with the patient feeling good about it at the end of the conversation because you've set clear expectations. So I encourage you to download that document and keep that as a reference at the front desk area so any team member that's taking a phone call will have the tools that they need to handle that cancellation phone call. So if there's anything more frustrating than cancellations, it's just a no-show. So maybe the patient confirmed and you, know, you were expecting them to be there and then they just plain don't show up. So I want you to utilize the resource document, the PDF document. That's going to also give you some verbal skills to use for those no-show patients. But it's important to call that patient as soon as you can. So five minutes into the appointment, if the patient hasn't arrived yet, pick up the phone and give them a call. Now, sometimes the person, whoever it is working at the front desk, sometimes they're busy and they maybe haven't noticed yet at that five minute mark that the patient's not there. Maybe they're helping another patient or on the phone. So my recommendation is the clinical team member that's waiting for this patient is the best person to make that phone call. 
you're the most aware because you're waiting to see that patient. And so take the initiative. If you notice that this patient isn't here and there aren't any notes about the patient um, running late or you know the, the business team member hasn't already addressed that, pick up the phone and give that patient a call and see if maybe they're on their way or if they just plain forgot about the appointment. And when you do that, you can utilize the verbal skills in the document to help you um, get them back on the schedule and maintain that relationship. There's a quick question here. Do you have any, do you by chance know the average no-show ratio in the industry that they're all fighting against <laughs> by chance? Or? It's huge. Well, I think the no-shows, the, the goal that I give teams that I work with, and I know that this seems like um, a really big goal to have, but I have lots of offices achieving this. The goal that I give practices is to have 5% or less open time. And so I know there are a lot of no-shows, and if that's happening in your practice, that is a symptom of not having systems in place for setting expectations and handling those consistently when they happen. So I do know that there is um, a lot of no-shows in dentistry, but what I've found is practices that put these systems in place, no-shows are a rare occurrence and not a common everyday problem. So there is hope. But it does take work for the team to set these systems in place to really set good expectations and clear expectations when the patients um, aren't keeping their appointment. The other thing that I would like to say about that is when you do have a patient that no-shows their appointment, when they call to get rescheduled, I don't recommend that you put them right back on the schedule. That, those appointments that are open next week or the next day, I would reserve those for patients that are calling in that didn't just break their confirmed appointment. I recommend that you find your next available appointment and add a few weeks to that. Um, you can always put them on a priority list to bring them back in, but you don't want to send the message that if you no-show your appointment or cancel your appointment for that matter, you just call in and the practice can get you right back in for another visit. So that's another tip that can help you with that. If you're not able to reach them by phone, I recommend that you follow up with a letter or an email communication communicating your concern um, that they didn't make their appointment. Um, you want to make sure that this initial communication that you do by letter or by email um, isn't real punitive because you never know if the patient um, had an accident, they, maybe something came up and it was an emergency. So that first communication in writing, whether it's written um, in an email or a letter, I would just be very concerned. We're very concerned that you missed this appointment. We hope everything's okay. Please contact our office just as soon as possible. And then on um, follow-ups after that initial one, you can address the issue that they did not keep their appointment. So it's really important to handle these consistently and have a protocol in place to handle these specific situations. So tracking these missed appointments, what is your system for tracking this? I'll go into offices and sometimes see an unscheduled list that you just scroll and scroll and scroll and there's just many names on this list that haven't been followed up with yet. So who's responsible for following up with these patients and um, you know, where are they making the documentation? Because if you have a chronic offender, if you have a patient that is no-showing or breaking their appointments consistently and it's not documented, then it's hard to take that into consideration or to use that information when you're making their follow-up appointments. Most practice management softwares have really good um, built-in systems that will allow you to track this and to document your conversations specifically for these types of, of situations. But it's just really important that you have a designated person that you know is um, responsible for doing the follow-up for these patients. Specifically in hygiene, I know that on some of the larger restorative um, procedures, practices are really good about getting back on the phone and getting those patients back in. But for some of your patients that are in hygiene, you don't want them to fall through the cracks and have too many months go by before we get them back into the practice. So patients do or past due. Before we talk about this system, I want to speak to knowing your capacity for hygiene patients. This is something that a lot of offices struggle with, um, knowing how many days of hygiene can my practice support. And so I want to give you an, an illustration on how you can 
um, calculate this. And if this is something that any of you want help with, feel free to contact me and I'd be happy to set up a complimentary analysis to help you um, figure out how many days of hygiene your practice can actually support. So this is a tool, um, a link tool that I use with my practices that I work with to help them figure out the exact number of days that they need in order to fill their hygiene schedule. And so I want to give you a specific example. And this is an actual practice that I've worked with. And these are their real numbers. And I want to give you a little bit of background on this practice. This practice currently has four days of hygiene that they're seeing. So four days of hygiene means they're open four days a week and they have one hygienist that works every single day in the practice. They have 1,295 active patients. So the way this calculator works is that you, um, it takes your active number of patients and then we look at how many patients do you see per day. And this is different for every practice. So for this practice, on average, they see eight hygiene patients a day. And then the next thing that we look at is how many weeks of are they open per year for hygiene. And this practice closes two full weeks out of the year, so they have 50 weeks of hygiene available. Now, the next part of the calculation has to do with your perio percentage in the practice. So if you have some patients coming in every three to four months, and some patients coming in every six months, that's going to um, have a little bit of a variable effect on how many days of hygiene that you need. So for this practice, the percentage of their patients that are perio patients is 25%. So 75% of their patients come in every six months, and 25% of those patients come in every three to four months for perio. So when we look at all of those different variables, the bottom line number, if you look at the very bottom number on this page, is this practice needs seven days of hygiene per week in order to support their number of active patients. Now, keep in mind, we're only using the number of active patients, the number of patients that have been in at least once in the last 12 to 18 months. So you can see the tremendous amount of potential that this practice has putting systems in place to keep their patients active. And so I did just a quick calculation for this specific practice on what would it look like from a revenue standpoint if they were able to put better systems in place to keep their hygiene schedule full and get to that seven days of capacity, which is what they can support with their number of active patients. And Based on their average hygiene production, this would add over $150,000 to that practice's bottom line in just a year's time, just in hygiene revenue. So if you think about that, the hygiene revenue is really just the tip of the iceberg of potential with having the appropriate amount of hygiene days scheduled. Because the restorative that comes from those extra hygiene days is just um, so uh, valuable to the practice. And so this is an example of why it's so important to know how many days of hygiene that your practice can support. And so this practice actually felt like they were doing um, pretty good for systems. And the reason why is because their schedule was full. Most days they were booked far on in advance. Their hygiene schedule was full. But the reason it was so full and uh, to capacity was because they really needed seven days and they had four, so they had this big excess of patients, so it was easy to keep their schedule full. And so it's exciting to um, help practices find this number. And, you know, I have had the opposite happen where we put the, you know, where we do the math together and we find out the reason they have so many holes on their schedule is their practice can only support um, four days of hygiene and maybe they have two hygienists that are in the practice. So it's really important to know what you're shooting for. What is the capacity in your hygiene department based on that number of active patients? So if you're interested in me helping you calculate that for your practice, be sure and contact me and we can set up a complimentary consultation to do that. And so for this practice, trying to close that gap, going from four days to seven, this is one of the systems that um, we're going to to use to make that happen. And so contacting your patients when they're due or past due for hygiene is one of the most important systems in your practice. 
And I'll be real honest with you, years ago when I practiced, this was one of those back burner type projects that we worked on when everything else was caught up in the practice. And so if everything was caught up and we had some downtime, we would work on the hygiene continuing care list. And that is not an effective system and it's not going to keep your patients active in the practice. And many practices are working this system as an afterthought and not something that they're working on on a weekly basis in their practice. So the first step in this system is to contact the patients before they're due for the appointment. Don't wait until they're actually due to start communicating with the patient. I recommend starting a month before their appointment to give them plenty of time to make it work with their schedule and to make sure that you can actually see them if they're not already scheduled um, when they're actually due. If you wait until they're due to schedule and your schedule's uh, maybe booked out four weeks, that's going to put them a month past due and we don't want that to happen. So I recommend that you call the patients and contact the patients before they're due. If they don't schedule or you're not able to reach them at that first point of contact, I recommend that you do a second follow-up communication on their due date or when they're due. And this gives you two opportunities while it's fresh, they're not past due yet, to get these patients in for their um, continuing care appointment. So the next step, step number three, you can see I have several different points of contact at, at three months, six months, nine, 12, and 18 months past due. And how I recommend you keep track of this is to create a calendar, and you can do this on an Outlook calendar or just a, a good old fashioned paper calendar, and I recommend that you divide these up based on the weeks of the month. And so you could, for example, on the first week of every month, communicate with all of your patients that are three months past due for their hygiene appointment. On the second week of the month, you could communicate with the patient six months past due. The third week, you could do the nine months past due. And then at the uh, fourth week, you could do the 12 and the 18 months past due. The nice thing about this system is these lists get smaller and smaller because people are are scheduling as you're adding points of contact. And by following this system, each patient is going to have the same opportunity to stay active in the practice. I have lots of practices that will think of a patient's name and say, whatever happened to this patient? And they'll look through their file and they'll say, wow, they missed a hygiene appointment a year ago and we haven't heard from them since and we haven't contacted them since. And then they may look at another patient record and we've contacted them 10 times to get them in for their appointment. And so it's overkill on one patient and zero communication on the next. So if you put it to a system and you track it with a calendar, this will ensure that all of your patients have the same opportunity and the same points of contact to stay active in the practice. Another tip that I have to enhance this system is if you're not able to reach them, let's say at the beginning of the week, based on your calendar protocol, follow up with something written at the end of the week. And that can be either an email or a letter, which sometimes the letters have even more impact once the, the patient starts to become 6, 9, 12, 18 months past due. Um, and this allows you to really um, communicate in a consistent way without um, overkill and just um, calling the patients too many times. I also recommend that you audit the system regularly um, and use your practice management software to give you an idea of what percentage of your active patients are seeing your hygienist on a regular basis because that's one of the key performance indicators that will allow you to know if you're reaching your potential in the practice. If 85%, which is what I recommend the goal is for this, of your active patients are in hygiene on a regular basis, then you know um, you're really maximizing that potential. So the next thing, once you have them in the chair and they're, they're active, they're in your practice, another thing that you can do to help keep them active is to really fine tune your patient handoff. So there are a couple of different types of handoffs. One is, I call it an internal handoff. It's really, what does the team member that you're communicating with need to know about this patient so they can take over from there? Lots of, lots of practices are using instant messaging or their practice man management software to communicate this. But the, the handoff I'm talking about and I want to talk about um, this evening 
is the handoff that is for a patient. Because the handoff that is for the patient is one that helps really um, reinforce the importance of keeping their next appointment. And so when you do a patient handoff, let's talk about the clinical to business team. Keep it really simple and include the what, the why, and the when. And you do this in front of the patient and you do this from one team member to the next. Make sure that when you're giving the what, why, and when that it's in patient terms. So the what isn't a DO, a DO on 15 or they need to have an FMX at their next appointment. The what is Kristen needs to come back because she has some active decay and we want to make sure that um, we get this taken care of so it doesn't create a toothache. So just the next available would be great because it's really important that we get this taken care of. So the what, the why, and the when in the patient terms is going to help reinforce what the clinical team has worked so hard to communicate in the back office, the patient gets to hear it one more time as they're being transferred to the business team. So you can see there are many different systems and many different areas that are important to have protocols for to keep your patients active in continuing care. And I know there are many others as well, but these are some of the key systems that when I see teams master these and I see teams doing these things consistently, they're really getting a, um, a clear picture on how the potential in their practice is being maximized. So I encourage you to schedule a team meeting to evaluate the systems necessary to keep your patients active. So just make a list of these systems that we talked about and what areas are solid in your practice and what areas need improvement. And I really encourage you to make it a priority to have these systems documented to make sure that you have that consistent process in place. So now that you have your systems in place, the next thing I want to communicate is the value. So this is one of my favorite quotes. So here's a simple but powerful tool. Always give people more than what they expect to get. Your patients will tell others when you exceed their expectations, and they'll also tell others when you're not meeting their expectations. Patients usually don't talk a lot to their friends and family if you're just simply meeting their expectations. So I encourage all my practices that I work with to have actual systems in place that allow you to consistently exceed your patient's expectations. Because every appointment is a big deal to the patient. So we want to make sure um, that we recognize that when we're um, treating our patients. How you greet your patient is very important. I recommend that you stand up when a patient comes in to greet the patient and let them know that you're happy to see them. Little um, tips like this make a big difference in how the patient feels welcomed and received into the practice. And so if you're not doing this, I encourage you to try it and notice how your patient responds. Um, having a photo of the patient in your software is very helpful so you can recognize the patient and greeting them by name is um, even better. If you can stand up and greet them by name, it really makes that patient feel special and welcome. Make it all about them. Avoid personal conversations between team members around patients. The patient that is in front of you is the most important thing and everything that we're talking about or everything that we're doing is about that patient that is in front of us in the moment. So always make sure that you're very attentive um, and in tune to the patient that's in front of you. The other tip to create value is to stay top of mind and do something unexpected to let your patients know that you appreciate them. Many of your patients um, only hear from you when you're giving them a notice, letting them know that they're due to have their teeth cleaned or a statement um, when you owe them money. And so if you're not already having other points of contact, I encourage you to add these things into your practice and do things that just help build relationships. You can do this with greeting cards, newsletters, thank you notes. Um, even if, as a practice, you can commit to having each team member send a personal note to a patient, um, even twice a week, that would have a really big impact on um, how your patients feel um, in your practice. And it will really make them feel special. So exceeding patient expectations. Um, is one of the things that many practices are working really hard to do and it's very important 
dentistry has changed a lot over the last 10 years or so. And patients are being a lot, uh, they're being really careful about where they spend their discretionary dollars or what they perceive to be discretionary dollars. And so if you're only meeting those expectations, then, you know, if the patient um, changes insurances, they may just change practices. But if you give them a reason um, to want to stay in the practice by exceeding their expectations, it really does make a big difference. And so create all of your systems from the outside in. Think about your systems from the patient's perspective. Um, you know, little things like even coordinating your specialist appointments. And so if you're referring to an endodontist, instead of just handing them the card, ask them if the patient would like for you to handle coordinating that appointment for them. Taking, um, just taking that level of customer service to the next level makes a really, really big difference. Another thing that I know a lot of practices are doing, but many aren't, is making post-op calls to your patients and following up with them. Some practices will create a rule that any patient that has had anesthetic, um, they'll get a post-operative call that evening. And I know a lot of practices that know about this, and maybe in the past it's something that they've done, but it, they've just gotten out of the habit. So if that's something that um, you're not doing, I really encourage you to do that with your patients. Um, your patients may um, not say a whole lot when you get in touch with them, but part of that is because they're so shocked that their doctor is calling them that um, they're just quiet on that call. But then they tell their friends that, wow, that was my dentist calling to check, check up on me. So things like that make a, a very powerful impact with your patients. Another thing that you can do to create value for the appointment is to give them a reason to come back. And so whatever that next step is, tie a specific reason to come back for that next appointment. And so it could be something as simple as, um, you know, Kristen, we noticed that inflammation we discussed in your appointment today, doctor wants to check that at your next appointment, so it's really important that we see you again in three months. So tie something specific about the patient's care to that next appointment, and if you can document that in your clinical notes, then other team members can utilize that information if the patient is attempting to cancel or if they're past due. I have hygiene coordinators that love having that specific reason for the patient to come back documented because when they're trying to get a patient to schedule that's past due, they really do utilize that information to create value in that next appointment. So creating value isn't just about the next appointment. You want to create value along the way. And creating value along the way is just making sure the patients know what you're doing. You already are doing so many things that are valuable in the appointment and things that set you apart from other practices. Make sure your patients know about this. So I've given you a couple of examples here. Um, one is letting them know that you're doing an oral cancer screening and telling them this is a really important part of this appointment and this is a screening that you're not receiving anywhere else. Or um, the reason that you're taking x-rays. So the doctor asked that I take x-rays to make sure um, if there's anything going on between your teeth, we catch it early. So letting the patient know the value behind um, what you're doing in every appointment allows them to just really appreciate you and what you're doing in, in the practice. So schedule a team meeting to really look at the areas where you can create more value or perceived value to your patients. How can you up-level that patient experience to exceed your patient's expectations? And really look at incorporating benefit statements into the clinical area. And the easiest way to do this is to just think about what do we do in our appointments and make a list. What are all of the different things that we do and how can we add a benefit statement to the patient as we're doing these procedures so they understand the value that they're receiving in their appointments. So at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said or did. They will remember how you made them feel. And this is so true. Patients um, really don't have a lot to go on on how to gauge why they come to you or what um, the reason that they come to you other than how you make them feel in the appointment. Do they feel well cared for? Um, do they feel special? Do they feel like a number in your practice? Or do they feel like there's a strong relationship between the practice 
um, and the patient. So it's really, really important to focus on that patient experience. So the last section that I want to talk about is mindset. And the practice mindset on keeping your patients active in the practice is really, really important. And I want to share with you some of the limiting beliefs that I see holding practices back from reaching their ultimate potential in this area. It's really, really key to check your attitude and enthusiasm levels based on, uh, you know, for any system that you're working on, your mindset towards that system matters. So I want to share with you some limiting statements and how you can turn those into powerful phrases and um, just a, a better um, overall mindset that will help you be more successful with these systems. So I'm sure you've heard this, and I promise I've said these things myself. That's how I know about these limiting statements. It can be very frustrating being the one responsible for keeping the schedule full, and sometimes these limiting statements make you feel better. You're venting. So when I read these to you, if it's something you say, don't feel bad. I said them too, working in a practice many times. Um, so one of them is our patients just don't value the hygiene appointment. They just don't. They're not going to come in. They don't value the appointment. So try and eliminate that from your vocabulary and change that to how can we as a practice make this appointment reflect the value that we know that it has. Um, another one that I hear all the time is we've called everybody on the list. We've tried everything. We just have holes. That's just the way it is. Um, and I know it feels you have, but I want you to think about how can I be more effective in scheduling from our list? What verbal skills can I enhance or what can I add to this call to be more effective to get our patients scheduling these very important appointments? And the, you know, the, the last limiting statement is the hygiene schedule will just always have holes. That's just the way it is. Um, and you can really turn that around by saying, you know what, our practice, we intend to reach our goal of filling the 95% of our hygiene schedule and we're committed to learning the best way to achieve that goal. There are practices that have achieved that goal through fine-tuning these processes that we're talking about this evening. And so just stay focused on that goal and um, stay focused on improving your processes. So, you know, think about this as a team. Are there um, limiting phrases that you're saying as a team that are holding you back from reaching your full potential, keeping your patients active in the practice? Because it's those routine appointments in hygiene, those continuing care appointments that really feed your restorative schedule. If, you, if your production relies only on new patients, you're spending a lot of money and working really, really hard when you have this um, opportunity right in front of you with your, current, with your current patients that are already in the practice. And so I encourage you to look at these areas of your practice um, where you can maybe change some of these limiting statements into power phrases and take your practice to the ultimate level of success by keeping your patients active in the practice. So one final consideration that I want to talk about in terms of keeping your patients active in the practice is I want you to evaluate your procedure mix. Now, there are some procedures, maybe um, whether it's some very limited, whether it's ortho or oral surgery or endodontics, that maybe you could be doing in-house because keeping some of these um, limited procedures in your practice, it will actually not only expand your procedure mix, but it can really enhance your relationship with specialists because you can communicate with them and say, you know, I want to try some of these easier cases in the practice and you can ask for their feedback or for their, for their help. So look at are there any procedures that you can keep in, in the practice that you're currently referring out. And companies like Densply Tulsa Dental Specialties offer you everything that you need to be successful with doing that. Um, one interesting um, thing that I've learned is that just one root canal a week can add up to $50,000 to your bottom line annually. And you know you can um, be very specific with your um, case selection, and um, that doesn't mean you have to do all the endo in your practice, but are there cases that maybe whether it's ortho, endo, oral surgery, or perio that you can be doing in the practice. And that's another way to, especially with new patients, um, if you're able to keep them in the practice rather than make your first um, uh, step to refer them out, um, sometimes that doesn't give enough time to really build the rapport 
to keep them active. So that's one final consideration um, to evaluate your procedure mix. So we've covered a lot of content, John. Absolutely. Great job. Right on time as well. <clears throat> Did you want to get to this uh, one of these questions here? Sure. Yeah. So um, one of the questions that I have here, um, oh, this is a good question. So it says, you recommend making confirmation calls, but we are 100% automated with emails and texts. Do we need to pick up the phone and call to confirm? So that's a great question. So um, my response to that would be, it depends on how effective what you're doing um, is in the practice. And so if you're not having issues with no-shows and what you're doing um, by relying completely on the technology is working, I suggest you stick with it. However, if you're noticing that um, at that one week communication, maybe the next day you still have appointments that aren't confirmed, at that um, point in time, I do recommend that you pick up the phone and start personally connecting via telephone with those patients. Another question that someone's asked is, um, what can you do if a patient just won't schedule their next appointment? And so you're leading them to schedule and they just won't schedule. So my suggestion is um, try and fine tune your verbal skills. Make sure you're leading them to schedule, um, giving them a couple of choices. And you also want to make them feel really comfortable um, and let them know that we're going to give you plenty of opportunities by checking in with you a month ahead and a week ahead of your visit um, so the patient knows that they'll have plenty of opportunities to make changes if they need to. And there's always that very small percentage that just won't schedule their next appointment, but I do recommend that you aim for that 95% minimum um, of your patients leaving with an appointment. If you take a look at a couple of these that have come in, I'll, I can maybe weigh in a little bit on this one but you can maybe start with that. Just encouraging another dentist to consider endo. <clears throat> okay, this is a good question. So how do you encourage an associate dentist to be more interested in endo um, when they're not? So um, for instance, if the associate says, I'm more productive doing crowns. So I think this is a great question that John can weigh in, but my suggestion is to um, find out more of the why behind it, because sometimes it's a lack of confidence or lack of training that is keeping them um, from taking that next step because endo can be very productive in a practice. So I would find out what specifically um, is keeping them from um, wanting to really take that next step with endo. And I would just throw in, not as a um, industry expert necessarily, but from our perspective, I'll be happy for have, have any of our reps come and visit anybody. If you need someone to come talk about what endo can add to your practice or to them, um, that'll be easy. So I've made note and I may uh, find out where you are and contact you to see if you want someone to come by and talk about that. It, you know, and the other thing is to speak to the benefit because um, crowns are very productive and one of the ways to ensure that um, that patient's going to be in the practice for the crown is to continue to build that relationship by, um, if you can keep it in-house, not, re not referring if it's a case that, that makes sense. So the next question is, the one-week confirmation appointment, should we cancel their appointment if we don't hear back from them? That is a great question. And so here's what I recommend for this. Now, I have some practices that, um, you know, I really just want to make sure that this, this protocol that I'm going to recommend is very clear because you want to make sure that you um, have really good communication around this. So what I recommend is that at the one-week call, if you don't hear back from them, I would continue to try and reach that patient. And remember, it's important that you set the expectation that you need to hear back from them. And that if you don't hear back from them, you'll be following up the next day. Once you get to the two-day mark, so it's two days before your appointment and you still have not had any responses from this patient. You've contacted them three to four weeks before, um, you've contacted them a week before, and then you've touched base with them every day since that one-week confirmation. And you have zero response. My recommendation is that you call them and let the patient know that you haven't heard from them and maybe they're on vacation, but if you don't hear from them by the end of that day, that's two days before the appointment, that you're going to remove them from the schedule and to please call you just as soon as possible. 
I would leave either an event or a note or something on the schedule if you do take them off the schedule. So if the patient walks in, the business team um, remembers the situation. They know that, hey, we had this patient that up until that uh, day before, we did not hear from them. So they can have that communication with the patient when they come in. And if they do, you just say, oh, Kristen, we've been trying to reach you for a couple of weeks now. Um, you know, did you receive our emails or our texts or, or any of our phone messages? And then, you know, if they're upset, you just apologize and you let them know, you know, we really tried to reach you. We thought maybe you were out of town. Let's get you back in and get you rescheduled. That happens um, a very small percentage of the time. How many of you, I'm sure, are in your morning huddles and you can name the people on the schedule that aren't going to show up? It happens a lot. And so don't wait for someone to create a hole on your schedule. Put these protocols in place, and with good communication, you should be able to prevent most of those instances. That's a great question. Great. Well, last thing I'll say as we kind of wrap up is I've now brought on a web links pod. Those are a few different links that you can check out on your own about some live courses we do, some more free on-demand CE similar to these that are in our library, and a page that has a lot of things we've accumulated from Kristen, including tonight's tips in a lot of different ways. I'd encourage that. And I guess my last thing to say, since she was nice enough to mention that you know, endo is a procedure you might add, certainly Tulsa Dental is all about endodontics. Um, and so I think it's very appropriate. We see endodontics as sort of a preventative uh, measure, and so it would fit very closely with what you're trying to do with your patients. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly we don't disrespect the fact that there's the need for specialists. We have many specialist uh, customers as well, and I think that, um, that dynamic between uh, general practice and endodontics is very important. So um, in fact, I think it could enhance. I think they would, they would want more root canals perhaps being diagnosed, because we know there's a lot that probably go unattended. Mm -hmm. So it's really not a competition between general and specialist as much as it is let's diagnose more of those opportunities. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, to be honest, I've not seen any more questions come back in. Um, I'll put a quick chat pod if anyone wants to say hi or sign off or anything to Kristen and thank her. Um, and don't forget, if you need the uh, CE credits, you'll do that quiz that's in the bottom right. Um, and take a look at these web links. Kristen, anything else? Just feel free to contact me. I have several ways that you can reach out to me if you have any other specific questions or would like help um, just really looking at your um, hygiene department. I can help you really determine the number of days that are appropriate for your practice so you can implement these systems and know what the target is and what the goal is. But thank you for having me. This has been great. You bet. We will keep the room open. We'll shut off the audio, but keep the room open for a couple minutes if you need to download some things or browse around or chat in. Otherwise, thanks very much for attending. Thanks. Good night.